Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Connor. I'm executive director of the Canadian Open Data Society, which was launched roughly 18 months ago. I guess, yes, about 18 months ago now. Uh, as a directive from the 2018 um, Canadian Open Data Summit, which uh, the attendees uh, decided we needed a permanent uh, community of practice, uh, a secretariat to uh, keep things going in between uh, summits. So uh, we had our summit uh, happen again last uh, September. It was a uh, an amazing success with double the number of participants that we expected, 600 folks registering, and a, a wealth of knowledge being shared that we captured and is now on YouTube and will shortly be on our knowledge uh, base, uh, of which more someday soon. Um, and today I am pleased to introduce uh, Ryan Andersoff, uh, who is co-founder of Think Digital and also uh, previously co-founder of the Canadian Digital Service in the Government of Canada. So uh, he's got a lot to share with us about uh, teaching digital to government executives and what it means for open data. So a uh, particular welcome to all uh, government executives, but I think uh, these lessons uh, are will be good uh, for all of us, uh, even former government people like me. So I'll just move on to the next slide. We uh, issue a standard disclaimer that uh, if you're going to make any momentous decisions, <laughs> do seek professional advice, uh, no matter what. Uh, this is for informational and educational purposes only based on the experience uh, and areas of expertise of our presenters. And, um, you know, uh, just proceed uh, with caution. So uh, I started to introduce the society a moment ago, and I will go on to say that we are nearing about 100 members. And uh, we've been in operation, like I said, for 18 months, and we are planning our next summit now for late autumn of this year, we hope, uh, of which more soon do sign up on our website to our newsletter or better still for a membership, uh, which is a low, low $5 per month if you are an individual. Um, and we always have volunteer opportunities that are interesting and engaging. Um, here's our vision, mission, and value proposition, which I will shortly also present uh, in French. Um, we do hope that Canada will be a global model, an exemplar of a gen genuinely open society, society that empowers and improves the lives of our people. Because, in part, uh, we freely publish, give access to, and use high-quality open data in all areas. Uh, and our job... And under this umbrella is to fulfill uh, our vision by bolstering our members' capacity to broaden the open data discourse, which even today is, is really about the public sector, but we are increasingly broadening the discourse to the private sector, civil society, and uh, academia. And uh, we hope to launch in the next few weeks, actually, uh, some tools that will uh, substantiate our aim to become a community of practice that advances learning standards and data quality, where we place the experts in our community at each other's disposal and at the disposal of our various members at all uh, levels of, of achievement and interest. Um, so we do advocate uh, for open data releases, access and standards and use. Uh, we try to promote awareness through our social media, particularly Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, of events and developments and jobs in the open data space across Canada and beyond. And uh, we have our monthly webinars and we're having a double feature because um, this March the 5th is Canadian, or excuse me, International Open Data Day. Our colleagues at Go Open Data are doing a major uh, event to launch uh, their uh you might call it their television channel uh, at noon on the 5th Saturday. And then uh, shortly after that at 3.30, we will have a funding uh, webinar special to you from MyTax. And they offer funding to nonprofits, municipalities newly, and uh, SMEs for uh, qualified interns and graduates. So we look forward to sharing that with you uh, in the uh, days to come. Here is our vision and mission and value proposition in French. And uh, while I leave this on the screen, I think we'll go ahead and uh, ask uh, Ryan to uh, introduce himself in uh, more detail, and then I will switch over to him sharing his screen. Perfect. Um, thanks, Paul. Really appreciate uh, the invite to be here uh, to yourself and to Derek, who had uh, had originally uh, approached me about coming to, to speak to the group. And welcome, everybody. 
um, who's joining us today. As Paul said, there's a lot going on in the world today, so appreciate you amidst all of this taking some time to, to join join myself and join everybody else and and think a little bit about digital and open data. Um, as as Paul mentioned, um, I run a company called uh, Think Digital. Um, we do um, consulting and training and advisory work um, around digital transformation, primarily in the public sector. Um, you know, our focus is really about helping organizations kind of make that transition to a, a digital mindset um, and thinking about, you know, how they adapt their practices and the way they work uh, for a digital world. I had previous to that spent many years um, in government, uh, primarily in the federal government, uh, based at a Treasury Board Secretariat um, in the Office of the Chief Information Officer for the Government of Canada, leading a number of initiatives around uh, digital, um, uh, digital collaboration, some of the early social media policy work from the federal government. And as Paul mentioned, uh, I was one of the co-founders of the Canadian Digital Service, which launched in, in 2017. Um, I also had spent a little bit of time with the OECD in Paris, working with governments around the world on, on kind of looking at how they were approaching uh, digital government. Um, and a few of the things I'm going to talk about uh, today actually kind of draw on some of my international work as well um, within the domain. Um, so really uh, thrilled to be with you all. Um, you know, and what we're going to do um, over the noon hour is I'm going to spend a little bit of time, I'm going to share a presentation with you in a moment and kind of walk you through a little bit of uh, of what I'll say kind of definitional or background work, just kind of looking at what we mean by digital. This is really kind of the realm that I work in. Um, and I think a lot of crossovers and links to, to open data that come out of that. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a bit about some of the educational work I've been doing specifically over the last few years um, through an organization called the Institute on Governance. Um, I am leading a uh, digital executive leadership program for government executives, and uh, it's been an interesting process kind of giving them a crash course on the digital world. And I'm going to share back with you some of what we've seen in terms of trends around that. Uh, and then I'm going to talk specifically around uh, open data. And I think some of the insights that have come out of that work um, and some other their initiatives I've been involved with and, and I guess leave you with some food for thought and hopefully some fodder for discussion around kind of where open data is at as kind of a movement within government right now and what some of the the obstacles or opportunities might be for the future on that. Um, so I'm going to share my screen in a moment, uh, but what I want to just mention was, um, as I'm go <clears throat> going through this, I certainly want this to be interactive. Um, if you have questions, if you have comments as I'm going through the presentation, um, do feel free to use the chat on Zoom. Uh, if you do want to ask anything or mention anything, I will keep an eye on that. Um, you can also use the, the raise the hand function on Zoom if you want to actually um, kind of jump in and be able to um, ask a question uh, virtually verbally as well. Uh, again, happy to kind of keep a keep an eye on that. Um, I think everybody should be able to, to see my slides now. If anybody wants to give me a thumbs up, yeah, there we go. Thanks, Amy. I see I see the thumbs up on Zoom. So that's great. Perfect. So um, I've talked a bit about uh, Think Digital already, as I mentioned, you know, where our focus is around advisory engagement and training and, and very much focused on kind of public sector transformation. Um, but I want to just start by talking a little bit about what I mean by digital and kind of this term that's being thrown around since it's, it's, it'll kind of anchor a number of things I'm going to talk about um, over the, the coming minutes. Um, digital certainly has become a, a big buzzword in, in recent years. It can mean a lot of different things to different people. Some of you might be familiar with this definition. It's the one that I often like to use, um, and it comes from a gentleman named Tom Lusmore, who was one of the co-founders of the Government Digital Service in the UK. And Tom's definition, I think, kind of sets up this two-sided equation in terms of what we mean when we kind of talk about digital, right? On the one hand, he's talking about the fact that it's not just the technologies that are kind of tied up with digital, but it's those culture, practices, processes, kind of the ways of working that are part and parcel um, with what we talk about in terms of digital. You know, this is things like being human-centered, um, taking agile approaches to solving problems or building products, all very much kind of part of that digital movement. Um, and then the second side of that equation, I think is importantly, is that these changes are being done 
to respond to people's raised expectations. Um, and I think importantly, you know, in the context, particularly of government, that people means both, you know, citizens, businesses, those that governments are serving, as well as their own employees, right? The reality is that both those citizens and the employees within government, you know, they live in a Netflix and Amazon and Google world. And so their expectations of what good service delivery, what good um, productivity tools look like in the in the context of today's world are really kind of shaped by those uh, those experiences. And we've seen that gap has in some cases been growing over time. So I always find this is kind of a helpful way to, to frame, you know, what we mean by digital. And I think as I transition a little bit later to talking about open data in particular, you know, I think the same notion actually applies, right? That, that with, you know, open data, it's not just about about the ability to kind of share data in machine readable formats, but it's those ways of working um, and those ways of kind of changing how the institution thinks about data that are probably just as important as the ability to actually share the data um, itself. Now, kind of building on that, there's these terms we also kind of hear thrown around uh, often about this digitization, digitalization, digital transformation. Um, they're sometimes used interchangeably. I, I think they kind of represent a bit of a digital maturity model. Um, you know, when we think about digitization, you know, it's really kind of that most basic approach of saying, how can we take something that might have been analog and turn it into something that's digital. You know, and a good example of that might be if you're a government department and you've got a, a form that a citizen has to fill out to access a service, you might say, you know, well, we're gonna take that paper form and turn it into a PDF that's up on our website. It's become digital, still not a super um, easy process to go through the person has to download it, fill it out. In some cases I've seen, you know, you have to download the PDF and then be able to mail it back or, or God forbid, fax it back to the government department. Um, but it's kind of a, a first step on that process. When people talk about digitalization, it kind of goes that step further of saying, okay, well, maybe we can actually take the process and transform how the operations happen in a much more integrated digital way. And so taking that same example, that might be saying, you know, instead of the PDF, we might actually create an online form that somebody can fill out and be able to submit online and, and have kind of a fully digital intake process um, around that. And then when we go to digital transformation, this kind of calls upon a much deeper transformation within the organization where it's saying, well, maybe instead of having that form that somebody has to fill out, we actually think about, you know, our data ac architecture on the back end and recognize that, you know what, we don't actually need the person to apply for the service in the first place because we know enough about them that we can actually automatically just push it out as a notification when they become eligible for something. So I think as you kind of go up that, that mental model around digital, we kind of move you know progressively towards seeing a much deeper transformation in the organization that's kind of driven by this. Um, and this mirrors a little bit, I think, what the evolution of kind of digital has been in the context of governments here in Canada. I'm going to, I'm going to talk specifically about the federal government uh, for a moment, but I think this, this timeline will generally apply to, to most levels of government here in Canada. Um, and I think there's been kind of three distinct phases in kind of government's digital journey over the last few decades. Um, you know, and the first was back in the mid-1990s, early 2000s. This was really kind of the, the early days of the internet as we know it today. Um, and at the federal government, there was this large initiative called Government Online. Um, almost a billion dollars in, in today's dollars were spent over the course of four to five years to take some of the, the top websites, top information, top services, and put them onto the web for the very first time. You know, the internet was for the first time kind of widely commercially available in the mid 1990s. Governments around the world and at all levels were kind of reacting to this for the first time. Uh, and Canada was was widely seen as a world leader in this. Um, you know, when when a lot of organizations were doing what they were calling e-government rankings um, at the time, Canada would routinely place in the in the top countries around the world for this, and was really seen as a pathfinder in this space. Um, we then went through this kind of second phase in the mid 2000s to mid 2010s, which people were calling government 2.0. 
Um, and government 2.0 was really about responding to the rise of social media, you know, things like wikis, like YouTube, um, like Facebook, you know, which we take for granted today were brand new on the scene. They were really disrupting kind of traditional ways of thinking around how do you communicate with citizens? How do you communicate internally? How do you share knowledge? Um, and part and parcel with this, we really saw the rise of the open government movement at this time. Um, and open data was really really kind of core to a lot of those early discussions around open government, you know, this ability that people were seeing to be able to share government's data assets much more widely than they were able to before, and to be able to do it in a way where um, it could be done that third parties or even, you know, kind of third party applications could be able to directly draw on that data and be able to build value on top of that. So this was kind of an important, you know, milestone, particularly from an open data perspective, around how government was kind of starting to think differently about this evolution of online technology. And I would argue are still in many ways kind of trying to deal with some of the implications of this uh, today. And then I think in the last number of years, the last five years in particular, we've seen this term digital government become much more prominent. And I do think digital government is kind of an additional phase that has evolved beyond those two, where beyond simply sharing information services online or looking at communicating and sharing data online in a different way, I think now we're seeing the conversation shifting to how does government itself change the way that it works um, to adapt to a digital the world and to take advantage of the new technologies that are available. Um, you know, a lot of our processes, a lot of our services in government are built up over many, many decades of, of practice. And I think the question that digital government is calling upon governments to think about is, should they be reinventing how they develop um, and, and kind of do policy development, do process development, do service development at a much deeper level? Similar to digital, there's a lot of different definitions of what digital government can mean. Um, this is one from my former team at the OECD that I like to share. And, and just two things, again, that I'll kind of point out here that I think in particular for this, this group will be relevant. One is this notion that it's very much about a government's modernization strategy, right? The digital government is, is beyond simply improving how services are delivered, but it's really calling on governments to look at kind of a deeper modernization to the organization. Um, and the second half of this is this notion about taking an ecosystem approach. That digital government is often not talked about in terms of government doing this uh, in silos, but government really kind of taking advantage of the ability to work with NGOs, with businesses, with citizens and associations, with individuals, um, you know, through the sharing of data, through the sharing of content, through kind of more interactive types of services to be able to be part of that modernization. So I think that ecosystem approach and the focus on modernization are two kind of key characteristics around digital government um, that have been coming up. So, you know, I, I think we're hopefully, you know, I'm getting being kind of clear on the point around this this notion of transformation and modernization is really core and key to all of this um you know unfortunately as kind of tongue-in-cheek as the comic points out for a long time i think even though digital transformation was being talked a lot about a lot it wasn't necessarily being given kind of the focus on the management agenda that people wanted right and this was kind of you know technology in general i remember certainly in those early kind of social media days this was seen as very much like we'll get some interns in to kind of deal with the social media thing um i think thankfully this has started to evolve and we're seeing a lot more kind of uh, senior management focus and attention on this in recent years, um, even kind of the creation of positions like chief digital officers in a lot of organizations, and actually in chief data officers being one of the newer kind of C-suite positions that has emerged around this, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so there are some positive signs that this is kind of being taken within the government context more seriously. Um, but again, you know, sometimes the, these questions are being viewed very much through the lens of technology. Um, and I really like this, this, this tweet, this quote from Jennifer Polka, who some of you may know the name. She was uh, one of the founders and one of the leaders of uh, Code for America, one of the big civic tech organizations down in the U.S. You know, and her point being, again, as, as we've been talking about, it's not just about the technology, right? There is this deeper um, simplification around policy and process that has to happen in tandem with our technology modernizing to be able to really kind of see results coming out of this. 
And I kind of like to think about this when we kind of think about the transformation challenge around all things digital um, and data. I like to kind of think about this concept I call the digital government pyramid. Um, and it's very simple in terms of kind of thinking about this theory of change. So, you know, like most hierarchical organizations, I find governments have tended to start at kind of the top of the pyramid and what I call the leadership and policy layer. Um, you know, we've seen in the Canadian context, you know, central agencies like Treasury Board, the Privy Council Office, um, you know, others who are kind of issuing new policies, issuing kind of direction, um, you know, initiatives like the Canadian Digital Service, which were meant at kind of a whole of government level to be able to inspire new ways of action. We've seen kind of similar approaches happening in provincial and even municipal governments across the country as well. Um, and it probably makes sense, right? It probably makes sense in a large hierarchical organization that you start at that leadership and policy layer. And a lot of the initiatives around digital in the last decade have really been about trying to influence that platforms and processes layer of government, that kind of messy middle um, in terms of how the work actually gets done within these these institutions but the reality is that i don't think it's been enough i don't think that the leadership and policy work that we've seen in kind of any of these domains has been enough to kind of fully move the ship um, and what we've kind of seen in the last number of years i think is thankfully an increased focus on the base of the pyramid of what i call the people and skills layer um, and this recognition that you know as much as we often think about governments as being these kind of uh mechanistic systems um, that are very much kind of a relic of the industrial age, they are ultimately human organizations made up of human beings. And I think with the kind of change that we're trying to see happen in government, you really need that people and skills layer involved um, to be able to work in concert with leadership and policy to make change happen in the system. So that's a little bit of kind of, of the theory of change that I like to think about in terms of, of the digital government movement quite broadly. And I, and I think that applies to a number of the pieces within there. Um, I've been really focused these last few years on that people and skills layer, because I do think it's, it's one of the most important ways to, to be able to move some of this forward. Um, you know, for my time in government, I certainly saw kind of the, the, the skills gap around digital transformation in the public sector. And I think particularly, you know, I saw a gap in the management and executive layers, and that's where I've been very focused for these last few years. Um, I uh, had partnered with a, an organization here in Ottawa called the Institute on Governance. Um, and uh, a little bit over three years ago now, we launched a, a new program called the Digital Executive Leadership Program. Um, you can kind of see our very first cohort back in December of 2018 there on the left, uh, and our most recent cohort, cohort 11, which is just a few weeks ago, which is now obviously because of COVID and our new ways of interacting has kind of fully transitioned into the metaverse. Um, but through doing this leadership program with executives across government, um, we took the approach of, of saying, you know, it's important for leaders today in the public sector to have an understanding of how the digital world works. Um, so we set this up as kind of a one week intensive boot camp uh, for executives um, to help them kind of understand some of the big drivers that are happening around digital and government. Um, we do kind of a, a day long intro to trends that are happening in digital, both here in Canada and around the world, get them kind of, you know, focused on what we mean by talking about digital and digital government. Um, and then we do a series of deep dives into design thinking, into digital tech, and into data science, um, which we've kind of seen as the three big pillars um, that are important to understand in terms of kind of the modern um, landscape, in terms of how those approaches work, the methodologies behind them, um, helping to kind of, you know, demystify some of the buzzwords around these topics as well. Um, and then we do a focus on what I kind of call taking action um, and really getting people to think about, you know, how they can take some of this back into their work and, and change the way that they're working in their organizations um, and, and think about how them as individual leaders can be able to, to make change um, back in their home departments. Um, use a variety of different ways uh, of being able to approach this, including some case studies, hands-on activities, and of course, lots of different speakers. Um, and really, you know, the, the goal behind the work we've been doing around education on this is to build that awareness around the trends, demystify the buzzwords, um, you know, and help people to be able to, to just be more 
um, digitally fluent leaders who, when they're sitting around the management table of their organization, can ask the right kind of questions. And, you know, ultimately, one of my big goals from this program is to help people be able to ask better questions at the end of the day um, and to build networks. I think one of the things we've seen, and I, I think this is true in digital writ large, I suspect this is true equally in the open data world, is that this kind of transformation can be a lonely journey. And I think, you know, being able to build that sense of community for people, of finding others who are going through similar challenges has been really powerful to be able to, to unlock people making progress um, after the fact. So we've been running this program for, for a little bit over three years now. We've had over 165 participants um, from, from dozens of federal departments, as well as some provincial and municipal governments uh, and the not-for-profit sector join us in the program. Um, and I wanted to share with you some of um, the insights that we've seen. And this is based on an article that I had published um, uh, last year, but the insights definitely hold true um, a year later, because we've seen some very common themes come up from the executive who've kind of come through our doors and been a part of this program. Um, so what we've heard from, from this group of public sector executives that have come through our digital leadership program is number one, I think this recognition that digital is no longer just an IT thing. Uh, I think there's definitely been this recognition that it's moved beyond simply being the domain of the chief information officer of being a kind of back office function to something that is really impacting everybody. Um, and I think increasingly everybody in their roles and in their jobs is, is seeing that digital is impacting policy, it's impacting programs, it's impacting service development, it's impacting you know, internal service enablement in a whole variety of different ways. So I think that's been an interesting mentality change that we're seeing certainly reflected in the people who've come through the program. Um, there is this kind of broad consensus, certainly amongst the executives we're working with, that user-centered design and agile approaches is really where government should be going. We certainly see this from senior leadership in government in recent years, that this is being talked about as being really core to how government uh, moves forward. Um, however, there is, there is a but, and, and, and the but is that those ways of working in the public service have largely not caught up, right? Things like budgeting and project gating and procurement and HR still come up time and time again as being real barriers to being able to make progress on these various topics. Um, and as I'm going to come to in a minute, I think this, this equally kind of has, has bled over into the open data world specifically, um, where these ways of, of working in the internal processes have not necessarily matched the ambition of, of where we would like to have seen progress happen to this point. Um, the rise of social media and other digital tools, certainly in the last couple of years, the move to kind of being on teams to being in kind of a fully virtual work environment, um, it's opened up new possibilities, right? The ability to communicate and collaborate um, are much more before, um, but uh, what it's done on the flip side is it's raised some real kind of what people call signal to noise problems that people are feeling bombarded by information from so many different sources and it's tough to have the time and capacity to be able to sort through it, let alone be able to derive any kind of actual insights or value that comes from all the data that they're bombarded by and we're certainly kind of hearing this from executives. Um, and then a sense of, of transformation fatigue. Um, you know, we've obviously been through um, a particular set of transformations these last two years driven by the pandemic. But even before that, there's been a sense within government that there's been kind of constant change, constant transformation initiatives. And I think a lot of the, the managers and executives we work with who tend to be on the front lines of that are feeling that kind of deep sense of fatigue um, kick in, even if they are enthusiastic in general about the goals behind that. And then, of course, you know, the, the elephant in the room, right, the, the kind of shared experience we've all had these last two years around COVID, um, which has had obviously very challenging impacts for many people on a personal and professional level. But the silver lining has been that it clearly has accelerated digital transformation in a lot of organizations, particularly within government. Um, you know, things that may have taken many, many years to accomplish or kind of reach fruition um, have been able to happen much quicker than they would have otherwise. Um, and we've seen this in terms of some of the external service delivery that was sparked by the pandemic, things 
like the CERB out of uh, CRA and ESDC, which was able to happen in, in record time, really, because of that real focus on being able to get something done and out the door. Um, I think this probably has risen those expectations even further from citizens in terms of what they can kind of come to see and expect from government. And we certainly see a lot more citizens who are kind of living their lives in, in that online world as a result of what's happened through the pandemic. It's of course, impacted government internally as well. And we've seen the, the huge change in the workplace to moving to, to kind of a fully virtual uh, work environment um, in, in virtually all government organizations. Uh, I'm sure many of you here who are from government, you know, have been living through this and it's starting to raise some real questions about what comes next and what is that kind of new equilibrium for the future of work look like beyond this. Um, and you know, as we kind of transition to talking more specifically around the data side of things, um, COVID's also kind of brought to the forefront some of the, the simmering debates around privacy, around what kind of information can be shared. It's brought a lot of interjurisdictional issues around data sharing, particularly in the health sector um, to, to the forefront. Um, and, and I think it's, it's kind of, again, accelerated some of these conversations and perhaps in a useful way um, to be thinking about, you know, um, the importance of data for decision-making um, at, at both kind of a government level, but also what it means from a citizen perspective in terms of how we're willing to share our data and who we're willing to share our data with. So this is some of the big trends that we've seen um, kind of unpacked from, from the people who've been through our, our doors around our digital leadership program and, and that we're coming up to. Um, but I want to kind of finally transition to talk about open data in particular. And I'm going to try to tie this all back together in the end, because I think, you know, open data is part of what we talk about when we're teaching around the digital world. We talk about open data um, with the executives who come through our, our digital leadership program. Um, and, and I think, you know, kind of in the context of these kind of broader changes I've been talking about with regards to digital and digital government, um, for, for this group, I want to kind of focus focus in um, for a few minutes on open data in particular and share a couple of my own uh, perceptions and thoughts about where that has been moving um, as part of this broader digital movement and hopefully kind of spark some discussion and open up for some for some Q&A to get your thoughts on this as well. So first of all, um, I want to just kind of I guess share how I would see a lot of government um, uh, executives in terms of their thought process or what they kind of think about when they think about open data. And I'm going to draw back on actually a little bit of work that I had done with the OECD a few years back on this space. Um, and so we'll do a little bit of a dive into history and then kind of come up to where I think we are today. But just on kind of a definitional piece, um, you know, people will often talk about this notion of, of public sector information, right, you know, kind of the, the, the totality of different types of information and data that the governments might produce. And within there, you know, we often see these concepts of big data and open government data that are part of that. Um, and I think importantly, you know, those will encompass some public sector information, not all of it. Some big data might also be open government data and vice versa, but again, not exclusively and not in all cases. Um, we also, particularly on kind of the big data side of things, see a lot of private and academic data that gets fed into that, particularly in more, I think, science-based departments that tend to have a lot of partnerships um, with the private sector and with academia to be able to, to share information back and forth. So we kind of have this data landscape for, for government organizations that might look something kind of like this. Um, and ultimately, you know, all of that data, all of that information is meant to be used to do some kind of analytics, some, some ability to derive meaning that's coming out of that data. Um, and so we see the, you know, the open government data being used in kind of public analytics or open analytics, whether it's government kind of processing that data and sharing it publicly, or it's simply through data portals, making the data available for others to be able to, to, to download and, and do their own analysis on top of that. Um, and then, of course, when we kind of look at more internal or proprietary analytics, we're seeing not just open government data being used, but some of those big data assets, or in some cases, data assets coming from the private or academic sectors as well. Um, 
and all of these are kind of driving towards being able to produce something that is able to derive some meaning from that. And in some cases, it could be apps that are created, it could be data dashboards, it could be as simple as inputs that go into, into briefing notes, again, from a, from a kind of internal government lens on looking at that data ecosystem. So this is how I think a lot of people kind of in government would kind of see what that data ecosystem um, looks like for them. Um, and particularly when we kind of talk about that bubble of open government data, um, you know, if we think back to 10, 15 years ago, to kind of the, the early days of the open data movement, uh, I think there's really kind of three types of value that governments kind of expected to get out of open data. Um, one is economic value. I think there was a lot of talk, certainly in the early days of open data, around how it can be able to spawn, you know, growth and competitiveness. New businesses would hopefully be created kind of around open data, um, and that ability to kind of foster innovation and effectiveness within government itself, being able to share more data more broadly. Um, there was this bucket of kind of value around social value, right? This idea of increasing engagement of, of citizens being able to be empowered to, to find more information, um, to, see what, to see what's kind of going on, to be able to self-organize in a different kind of way built upon this. Um, and then kind of the public governance lens, which was really about kind of the open government side of accountability, transparency, and responsiveness, being able to hold governments to account better because they were sharing more data more broadly. I, you know, I kind of think back to some of those early conversations around open data, um, you know, it, around 2010 and, and kind of the mid 2000s. And it was really, you know, these three buckets, I think of economic value, social value, and public governance value tended to come up time and time again. Um, and we saw this kind of reflected in kind of early open data strategies that came out of a lot of governments. This data is, is almost about 10 years old now. This is from 2013. Um, and this is, you know, really at the time, this comes from the OECD, uh, from the team that I was working with there a few years ago. Um, and this was kind of those early days when a lot of governments were first putting forward um, open data strategies or open data policies. And amongst the OECD countries, they had done some survey work to kind of find out, you know, what was really driving those open data strategies or policies. And it really kind of grouped into, into three kind of clusters, right? And, and the most popular kind of driver behind this was this mix of kind of transparency um, uh, and innovation uh, types of drivers, you know, the economic value ones, uh, creating new businesses, but also um, this, this kind of push forward openness and transparency. So we really saw those two kind of rising to the top in terms of drivers behind open data. Um, there was then also this kind of other set of drivers around uh, public service efficiency, right? Kind of looking at how the public service itself could potentially become more efficient through the use of open data. Um, and then a much smaller driver behind this was around public participation um, and being able to use this to support uh, citizen uh, decision making and engagement in public debate. So again, this is a picture, I think, if we look back a decade ago of where a lot of governments, not just here in North America, but around the world, were really kind of thinking about for open data in terms of what was driving them behind this. Um, you know, and, and here in the Canadian context, um, if you all remember, it's, it's actually uh, almost 11 years to the day. Uh, in a few weeks here, it'll be 11 years since the launch of the open data portal at the federal level. And so in 2011, we saw the federal open data portal launch. Uh, I believe it was the year after the first uh, open data action plan or open government action plan, I should say, for the government of Canada was launched. So we're at about kind of that decade mark, uh, at least from the federal government's perspective of having this kind of consolidated push around an open data strategy and, and some of the, the tools and platforms that support that. And so, you know, I, I'd be very curious to kind of hear from all of you in terms of your reflections on this, but my sense of this, you know, 11 years later, um, is that we've kind of reached a, a little bit of, uh, uh, of, a, of a trough around where open data has moved. And, and I wanna just kind of uh, explain the graph you see up on the, on the screen in front of you. Um, this is a mashup of kind of two things that, that two different kind of concepts that you might be familiar with. One on the top is uh, the Gartner hype cycle for kind of new technologies. Um, this is kind of Gartner's model for how new technologies get incorporated uh, into organizations and, and evolve over 
time. Um, and the bottom is uh, from Jeffrey Moore's work around the adoption of new products into the marketplace. And both of them kind of have this notion of, you know, once you get through kind of the initial peak of excitement, kind of the early adopters and innovators in the, in the space, you fall into, you know, what Gartner calls the trough of disillusionment or what Jeffrey Moore calls, you know, the chasm. Um, and a lot of the challenge around being able to scale up innovations or new technologies or new ways of working is being able to bridge that gap. Um, and I, I think from what I have seen and certainly from what I hear from a lot of people um, within government from different perspectives is that open data, you know, may very well be at that point point right now in its maturity cycle of being kind of in a bit of that trough of disillusionment or, or facing a bit of the chasm, you know, after kind of the early excitement around it, it it's kind of facing that tough moment of saying, how do we actually scale this up further? Um, and to be able to see this become a much kind of bigger part of how governments are able to work and be able to find value coming out of all of that. Um, and I'll be very interested if folks disagree with this. And I'd love to kind of hear people have a different perspective on where they think um, open data is at right now in terms of its life cycle around this. Um, we've been actually doing some work in the last um, in the last year um, through the Institute on Governance, looking at the role of the Chief Data Officer in the Government of Canada. Um, and we actually next week we're going to be doing a talk through Forward Fifty. It's a it's a public talk, so a little little bit of a promo for that for those who are interested in this, um, sharing some of our findings that have come out of that work. Um, but one of the things, not to kind of not to spoil too much of the surprise around it, but one of the things that we have found as we've been kind of looking at at the evolving governance around data in the government of Canada is that perhaps unsurprisingly and kind of building on what I was just talking about, um, open data has generally been, been seen to be kind of lower on the priority list for a lot of chief data leaders uh, across the federal government. Not to say that it isn't important, but in kind of the, the, the long list of things that they are looking to try deal with or try to accomplish, um, you know, the work that we've been doing over this last year on this chief data officer study has been kind of confirming some of the suspicions I had which is that open data is not at the top of the priority list in the same way that it might have been a decade ago um, when we kind of look at the data movement across government. And so why is that? And I want to kind of just leave you with a couple of thoughts about why that might be if we kind of accept if we accept that hypothesis that that open data um, has not been kind of getting as much attention as it would have liked it to have had, or has that not matured as far and as fast as as maybe would have been ideal. Um, and so one of the big drivers behind this, and I think this applies to digital more broadly as well, is, you know, this old paradigm that the culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and I think that's 100% true. You know, we've had um, countless different types of digital strategies. We've had countless different types of open data strategies. Ultimately, though, if the culture of the organization is not aligned with that, the culture is going to overwhelm uh, any kind of strategy that's being able to be put on paper. But I always argue that there's kind of two bigger fish uh, to this piece of the puzzle as well. And I think incentives eat culture and structures eat everything else. And what I mean by that is, you know, incentives are really the ways that people are rewarded in the organization. You know, what gets you promoted? What gets you disciplined? How do, what do you measure? What are in people's performance agreements? You know, these types of um, factors really kind of shape the culture of the organization and shape the direction that it kind of collectively moves in. Um, and similarly, structures are really about how decisions are made in the organization, right? What does your governance and gating looks like? How do budgets get decided? How are staff allocated? Um, the policies and regulations um, that, that kind of surround, you know, how government itself works if we're looking at it through that lens. And, you know, I would suggest that the digital more broadly and open government as kind of a specific piece of that have all kind of struggled from the perspective of the incentives and structures of the organization having not yet evolved to be able to enable them. And I, and I really think, you know, from my perspective, this is the area where, you know, those of you who are interested in kind of how do we modernize public sector organizations, this is where the real work is around thinking 
about those incentives and those structures in the organization and how we can start shifting them. Because I think, you know, if we want to see sustainable change or sustainable progress, it's tough to imagine us getting there if we don't also see changes in the structures and incentives of how these organizations work. Um, and there's been some moves towards that, you know, certainly things like the Government of Canada's digital standards are an attempt to kind of move the needle on this a little bit. Um, and certainly I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, you know, there's at least three of these that are quite specifically focused around open data. Um, and, you know, I think as these hopefully become more operationalized, it'll start to kind of, again, change some of those incentive and structural issues that I'm talking about, but it probably is not going to be enough by itself. And so I think for me, this is kind of one of those areas that really requires a lot more thought and kind of effort and push um, in, in kind of the, the months and years to come to be able to, to see some progress around this. Um, it, there's this quote from uh, Scott Bryson, the, the former Treasury Board Minister um, and Canada's first Minister of Digital Government, where he was fond of saying in the 21st century, you're either digital or you're dead. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of truth behind that. Um, I often kind of think about the, though, I think in the case of government, there is this third option of becoming a digital zombie, right? I think government is kind of that classic example of an organization that's too big to fail in a way. And, and I think we kind of risk without there being some real concerted effort around this, that government essentially kind of sleepwalks into doing just enough to modernize, to kind of keep moving, but not enough to really kind of um, see the benefits that come out of this. And so to me, this is the real kind of trap that I think governments have to avoid in kind of the broad digital transformation space. And I think, again, this applies equally in the open data space is, you know, how does it actually keep that momentum up to really kind of transform and not simply do just enough to kind of show that it's doing something, but not kind of be able to reap the benefits from it. So final slide, I want to just share to kind of wrap this all up and, and bring it together and, and then open this up for some discussion. Um, I, I want to share just a few key take, takeaways for me from an open data perspective in particular, from the work that we've been doing over the last number of years, from you know what I've been seeing personally and what I've been hearing from uh, the people who have been engaged with us on the work we're doing and on the training we're doing as it applies to open data. Um, I do think, as I said, I think open data is facing a bit of that trough of disillusionment moment right now in government. Um, and I certainly see the conversation around it amongst, you know, most executives and leaders being that they see a lot of perceived barriers and risks um, where the potential benefits are much less visible to them. Um, Paul and I were just we were chatting before the session started today and Paul was mentioning some of the work that the Open Data Society is doing around sharing case studies and examples of how open government data is making a real difference. And I think that work is so important behind this because I do see that a lot of people um, you know, who are in decision making positions still don't necessarily kind of conceptualize what those benefits might be. And that ability to share success stories, I think, is really important to be able to be an antidote towards that. Um, building on that, I do think as well, you know, the communications culture in government tends to trump instincts for openness. Um, and I've seen time and time again, I hear this time and time again, that even in cases where people want to share more information, want to share more data publicly, there is this instinct to say, you know, what is the communications risk? Can it open it up to us to embarrassment? Um, you know, what are the potential kind of ramifications around that? And, and some of that is legitimate. I think, you know, governments, you know, do have to have some concern around that. Um, but I think it's worth kind of calling it out and mentioning that if we don't kind of think specifically around this relatively restrictive communications culture, I think particularly here in Canada that we've built up over time, um, it is going to be tough to have those incentives around openness be able to be well aligned. Um, on the topic of aligning incentives, right, I, I think this notion around how do we kind of move those those bigger pieces of the Pac-Man slide on this um, come to the top of my mind, right? I think in a lot of places, data is still seen as an asset to hoard or protect um, rather than one that can actually generate value from being made, uh, made more open. Um, and one of the kind of caveats I want to put on this, and this really came up in that chief data officer study that we're, we're doing right now, is I do think science-based groups and science-based 
science-based departments in government are a really important exception. I think people who are working in the science sector, by nature of their work, they inherently um, are driven by the value of sharing with others. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a good kind of um, uh, counter example of, of pockets where people actually do see their incentives aligned um, for being able to share data that's out there. Um, I think there's an issue around resourcing, right? I think the internal allocation of resources and government have certainly not matched the initial ambitions um, of the open data strategy or open data action plans um, at the federal level, but I think this is true in other levels of government as well. Um, you know, I, I think open data was seen in many cases as being kind of an add on to people's existing jobs. And, and as all of you know who are in government, people don't have a lot of extra capacity for the most part to begin with. Um, and so I think this notion of how do we align on resources with the ambition we might have around open data is a really important one. Um, and then finally, and I think linked to this, you know, the business model for open data hasn't seemed to emerge organically at scale, certainly in, in kind of the government context. We saw in kind of the early days of open data, you know, some companies that were kind of popping up around, um, you know, very tangible data like, like bus, you know, transit data at the municipal level, right? And they were able to build apps and companies around this. Um, but there does seem to be a bit of a gap in terms of being able to build that ecosystem of companies and organizations or even kind of civic organizations that can take government data and be able to kind of build value on that. And one of the questions I've been really kind of thinking about is, you know, can a better resourced uh, civic tech movement be able to help unlock some progress um, into this area as well? Um, and so I think it, it's an area for me that there could be some really productive uh, uh, exploration of in the, in the months and years to come on this. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I think gave you a lot of a lot of material to kind of think about um, and ponder on this. Um, I know we've only got about five minutes left. I'm happy to stay on though if there's uh, if there's some additional questions beyond that. Um, and I see there's been a little bit uh, going on in the chat already on this, which is great. But Paul, I'm happy to kind of open the floor up and and take questions, have discussions, and get people's reaction. Well, uh, I'm seeing in the chat uh, that you, where you referenced a couple of articles, uh, would you be able to share the links now or later? I will be sharing the video around and I can include it then if you need a little time. Yeah, and, and Paul's just going to say, I'm happy to share with you my slides. And if you want to distribute it to participants, uh, very open to that. Excellent. I see a question, a raised hand from Lee. Lee, uh, please go ahead and unmute. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. Thanks for Hi, the Lee. talk. Just a quick question. Um, in the digital transformation space, is there ever disagreement over whether a digital transformation should occur? Um, I could think of maybe an example would be there's a lot of speculation in, in like the ed tech space could revolutionize the classroom, but I might be a bit cautious as maybe having smaller classrooms, better funded schools yeah. might be a better yeah. solution. So anything generally around that space? I know it's sort of a broad question, but... No, it's, but it's a really important one, Lee. And, and I think, so the short answer is yes, right? And that's actually, you know, when I kind of think about digital transformation, it's, it's actually why kind of human-centered design to me is, is it should be at the core of that. Because really, I think, particularly in government, people don't spend a lot of time really kind of thinking about what the actual problem is they're trying to solve, right? And that's kind of what you're getting at. And, and that's why I think people are talking about design as being so core and fundamental to digital, because that really kind of pushes people into saying, you know, let's spend time actually talking to real people and understanding what the problems are. Because to your point, in many cases, it may not be a digital solution that's needed, right? I mean, if you're simply automating bad processes or bad policy, you're not going to get better results at the end of the day. So just to say, I think you're 100% right. Um, and I think the issue becomes, you know, it, it's kind of figuring out where do you use the technology where it's most effective, but how do you actually maybe sometimes find different approaches um, that, that don't require a technology solution, but require a different way of doing things. Uh, Tim, your hand is up. Hi, yes, thanks. That was really interesting. Um, one question that occurs to me, um, so I come from a sort of a more sciencey background. One of the main drivers for doing open data is that people tend to believe you more when you when your document, when your research article has the data associated with it. So this seems to me to be a real kind of easy win for government when they put out a document just to say the data associated with this document are available in the following places and, and to put out an open document, uh, an open data document. Is, does that ever get discussed? Is that something that's considered? 
Yeah, I mean, so I, th- I think you're right about that. And we're obviously living at a time where we are dealing with kind of an epidemic of misinformation and disinformation online, right? And not just online and kind of our, in, our, in our world more broadly, uh, trust in government is kind of at all time lows uh, in most jurisdictions. And so I would tend to agree with you that I think kind of the open data movement writ large can hopefully be a bit of an antidote to that. I think the problem becomes um, that you know, back to kind of my resourcing point, it also takes resources to make sure you have good quality data, because that's the flip side. And I think that's actually the, you know, when I was kind of talking a little bit about the risk that I see a lot of decision makers have around this, is I think, frankly, they're concerned that they put data out there, and then then people find errors in it, and then it kind of destroys trust even more. Um, And, you know, people obviously kind of gravitate towards the sexy piece. And so, you know, people want to see data visualizations and data dashboards. But, um, you know, the, the work around kind of cleaning the data and making sure you have good quality data, I find that there has not been as much resources in many places put into that. Again, I think the science areas are different, right? Because the drivers behind scientists tend to be very focused on data quality. But I think there's a lot of other parts of government where there hasn't been the same level of focus and resources put on that. And not having good quality data going out, I think, does have potential risk for the other side um, is that if you put it if you put data out there and it's seen to have major errors in it then it can destroy trust even more so I do tend to agree with you Tim but I think that's where some of that tension in my in my view tends to come yeah. from there was um I'll throw the link in the chat there was a, an, a study by the Pew Foundation showing that um, it's like 70 percent of people believe research articles when they hear the data are available Yes, or not. So it's very, it's a striking thing. But absolutely, if the data turn out to undermine the article, that maybe, maybe they shouldn't be making decisions based on that data in the first place. Well, that's a great point. <laughs> exactly, it's a great point too. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, uh, Francois. Hey, Ryan. Hey, uh, Francois. Great, pre- great presentation. I, I and, and on on the chat, we were kind of debating. Uh, is it is it the level of effort? It kind of strikes me in some respects that uh, the reason why we're in a bit of a trough right now, the open data perspective, is that there's that that kind of lack of killer return on investment, yeah. killer example of this is really good and this is how and when we should use it. And yeah. it sounds really mundane, but you hit you hit the Martin nail on the head in terms of the quality the quality of the data, the readiness of the data to be shared. The, the internal effort to leverage data from across different branches, different teams, different groups that isn't managed uniformly. The CDOs have a huge challenge, but yep. then you've got this thing in the toolbox and you're never quite sure when it's relevant to pull it out uh, other than to meet you know, your mandatory proactive disclosure requirements for binders and whatnot. Um, and then that's a whole other world. But no, there's, there's definitely a thing there where we could do more from a social policy, labor market policy, et cetera, perspective, we just don't know how. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, and I, and I think kind of back to like you know Derek's comment. I was just kind of re- reviewing what he was saying on this too. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think there's a little bit of like not knowing how, a little bit of not knowing where the data is. But 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 I think Francois, like you're you're kind of hitting a really important point is this return on investment. I don't think a lot of people see what it is, right? Like, like I think people who kind of are in the open data space get it and and are kind of evangelists for it. But when I mean, when I talk to a lot of people in government, particularly decision makers, I think when they talk, when you talk about sharing data more openly, all they see are the risks that could potentially come from that. And they're not seeing kind of the immediate return on investment, you know, for for them, kind of as an individual, right? Like, like for them as an individual, well, they're, they're, it's the, yeah, it's not even sometimes the question of risk so much it's, it's the amount of effort. That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's effort, it's resources, it's kind of saying, you know, if I'm going to devote X percentage of my team's time towards this, see you, Derek, um, if I'm going to support, you know, put this much of my team's effort towards this, what am I getting in return for that? And I, and I think that's, it's a, I mean, this is a problem always in government in general, is you don't have the same kind of easy bottom lines that you can measure as you would in the private sector around this. But again, you know, I kind of go back to that point, I think being able to like highlight these examples of where there really can be strong return on investment on it is important to be able 
able to drive that forward to see it. To be frank, my experience has been that the municipal level tends to actually have that stronger tie to kind of direct return on investment. Somebody was mentioning, I think Lee in the chat was mentioning about Edmonton, which absolutely was, was a huge, you know, early leader in municipal open data here in Canada, just because a lot of their data tends to be very kind of tangible data, right? Kind of linked to municipal services and in areas where you can kind of see the sharing of it can kind of add value back directly, right? Whereas in some federal departments, the data can be a little bit more amorphous or seem a little bit kind of further away from the pavement, so to speak. Um, and so I think that is a challenge. I think it's there. I do think it's there, but I think getting people to see those real examples um, of return on investment are important. But the one last thing I just want to mention on this, because I think it's, it's an important piece that I hadn't said before. I think in those early days of open data, there was kind of this misperception that you could just put this data out there and magic would happen and suddenly all this value would come. And I think what people have learned is it actually takes effort and resources to be able to do that effectively. And that's, that's where I think the piece has been missing. Like when open data was seen to be this kind of free add on that you could just put it, you know, put some Excel spreadsheets out there or some CSV files and everything would kind of magically get solved. People were kind of on board. But when they realized, hey, we have to actually put real resources and money and human beings onto this to make it effective. I think I think exactly to your point, that's where we've kind of, you know, we, we've kind of run into some roadblocks around it. Okay, well, we're just at a little after one. So maybe I will uh, close the proceedings here. Thank you very much, Ryan, for uh, most uh, fascinating and engaging presentation, which I think we'll even be building on in the weeks and months to come. We'll be referring back to it. So thank you. And I'll look forward to uh, sharing your slides and this recording and uh, anything else uh, with uh, anybody who wasn't able to attend or not attend the full uh, session today. And I uh, just re like to remind everyone to, uh, if they can, register for International Open Data Day on uh, Saturday, March 5th at 12 o'clock. We've got uh, Go Open Data's uh, introduction of their uh, TV channel, as they call it. And at 3.30, we have a presentation from MyTax, who provides funding to municipalities, nonprofits, and small businesses uh, that may include open data projects, such as uh, that back-end work that we all know needs to be done. So uh, thanks very much, everyone, for joining us today and uh, have a great afternoon. Thanks everybody. Great to be with you.